Um, published in 1937, started in either summer of 1930 or 1931, I can't remember which. Um, I don't remember if I've mentioned this in class before. Tolkien was marking entrance exams into Oxford. Um, one summer he was sitting in his study over his garage marking entrance exams, essentially like a blue book, and he turns the page and there's a blank sheet, a blank leaf in the blue book that he's marking. And he just writes, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. He had no idea what it meant. He had no idea what a hobbit was. Okay, It was just spur of the moment kind of thing. You can actually, uh, if you look at the Tolkien papers in um, the Bodleian Library, you can still see this because these were exams that were not given back to students. They were exams students took to see whether or not they were good enough to get into Oxford. On the basis of that one sentence in A Hole in the Ground There Lived a Hobbit, he started to think about it and he started to write a story, but he didn't begin by writing it. He began by co composing it in his mind and telling it to his children. Okay, he had four kids. Um, the oldest one at that point would have been, I don't remember exactly, 12 years old, something like that. Um, or maybe that was the youngest one. Anyways, he started telling it to his children, and then he began sharing it with his friends, the, the inklings that regularly um, met, and sends it off to a publisher, um, a guy named Stanley Unwin, in 1936. Unwin gets the manuscript, or the typescript, has on the top, The Hobbit, or There and Back Again. Okay, and doesn't have a clue what this thing is. He doesn't know what a hobbit is. And he isn't necessarily all that interested in finding out. So Stanley Unwin gives the typescript to his 10-year-old son and asks him to read it on page review slash recommendation. Publish it or not. Okay, 10-year-old son. His son reads it, types up a one-page response, and essentially says, this will become an instant classic. The kid's 10 years old. Okay? Stanley Unwin, on the basis of his son Rayner's recommendation, publishes The Hobbit in a small print run. I think it's like 1,500 or 3,000 copies. It's not, not many at all because he doesn't want to lose a lot of money on it. He thinks he's going to lose money, but he's not willing to sacrifice a lot. Okay? It sells out. They print more. They sell out. Okay? Um, it is exactly what his son said it would be. It is an instant classic. I mean, this thing starts to sell like crazy. Tolkien does go back and make some changes in chapter 6, I think it is. Uh, no, chapter 5, Riddles in the Dark. Tolkien makes some changes between this publication and The Lord of the Rings. He changes some of the what Bilbo says um, in the riddles and stuff. If you can get a first edition of The Hobbit with the original language in that chapter, um, or if you were to try to buy one, it would cost you probably about a hundred grand. I mean, it, it is a very, very um, high value collector item. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. An unexpected party. If you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings, that's kind of how the Lord of the Rings begins. But the Lord of the Rings begins with a long expected party. Okay? In a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down or on 
or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. Okay. What does he mean that means comfort? It means this hole is furnished. It has floors. Okay. It's got a kitchen. It has a pantry. It has a cellar. It has a sitting room. It has a bedroom. Okay. Very civilized. I mean, this is essentially a 19th century Victorian home underground. It's essentially what it is with round doors. Okay. Round doors are not they're not necessarily common in England, but they're not uncommon to be in a small village or even um, a few places in London to see homes with perfectly circular doors. Okay, so Tolkien's not just pulling that out of thin air. That's part of his experience. Okay? And so we get a long um, paragraph about the hobbit hole in Holmes, and then we get descriptions about this particular hobbit, who he's related to and such. And we hear, beginning around page three or four, that Gandalf came by. Bilbo's out front smoking his pipe okay, on the morning that the adventure begins. Um, we're told all that the unsuspecting Bobo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. Tall pointed blue hat, long gray cloak, silver scarf, white beard which hung down to his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning, says Bobo. Sun was shining, the grass was green, he's got his pipe, he's happy. Okay? And the old man says, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Someone says good morning, they kind of mean good morning. Do you wish me a good morning? Or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? Okay? Bilbo, all of them at once. Yes. Okay? Why is Gandalf being this way? He's being kind of prickly, okay? He's being very um, pedantic. Gandalf, in this instance, I'm not saying anything about the rest of the novel or even The Lord of the Rings, but I kind of think Gandalf, in this instance, is based upon one of Tolkien's friends at this time, C.S. Lewis, okay? Lewis was tutored before he went off to university. He left boys' school, he left boarding school, and was tutored for a couple of years before he went off to Oxford. Okay? He was tutored by a man named Kirkpatrick. That was his last name. But he had just the nickname, the Great Knock. Okay? This guy was what is called a logical positivist. It's a branch of philosophy, and it essentially means he tested everything. Any comment somebody would make, he would challenge them. He, in other words, what he was trying to do for the people that he tutored, Lewis in particular, is he tried to make them see or to understand the validity of every statement made. Prove it, in other words. So, you talk to somebody, they say, see you later. Kirkpatrick wouldn't let him get away with that statement. How do you know you're going to see me later? What's your proof of that? What's the evidence of that? Now, obviously, that could be really annoying. Because nine times out of ten, when people talk... Do they really mean what they're saying? No, it's just talk, okay? Kirkpatrick didn't like that. And he, he thought that was one of the problems with society at the time. I frankly think he's today much more right than he was back in the 19-teens. Just turn on the news, turn on the TV, and what kind of talk do you hear? 
it's blather. Okay, that is, it's not talk that is meant to actually communicate something. It's it's doing this. It's people talking over each other. So, I think Gandalf at this point in this little instance is based upon Lewis because Lewis at this point in his life was exactly like his master, his teacher was. People would make a comment and he'd, like a hound after a rabbit, he'd hound them until they could prove what it was they were saying, which is why nobody wanted to get in a debate with them. Okay? So, Bilbo, all of them at once, and a very nice fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors. So, if you have a pipe, take a seat. Gandalf does. But he says, I'm not here to blow smoke rings. I'm looking for someone to share in an adventure that I'm arranging. And it's very difficult to find anyone. Bilbo, well, of course. We are playing quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things. Notice what adventures do. Make you late for dinner. What is dinner? Is it the meal that's eaten at evening? Or is it the meal that's eaten kind of in the middle of the day? See, different parts of the country answer that differently. In the South, dinner is kind of more middle of the day. Where I'm from on the West Coast, dinner is always evening. Okay? Though we do also have the word supper for that. Well, you come to find out, hobbits generally eat more than three times a day. They eat several meals a day, which is why they're fat. Okay? So, Bilbo goes on. I can't see, can't think what anybody sees in them. Sticks his thumb behind his braces and his suspenders. Blows out another smoke ring. And then he pulls out his morning letters, his mail. He's got it stuck in a pocket. He pulls the mail out. Gandalf's still standing there, holding on to his staff. So when Bilbo pulls out his mail and starts reading it, what is he doing? Okay, what else is he doing? What is he being? Let me put it that way. Rude. Rude. You're in a conversation with somebody. Is it ever polite to act like they're no longer there and start reading something? No, it's not. Okay? So he just kind of ignores Gandalf. And the narrator tells us he decided that he was not quite his sort and wanted him to go away. But notice he doesn't say, I want you to go away now. Because that would be verbally rude. But the old man did not move. He stood leaning on his stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything. Till Bilbo got quite uncomfortable. Okay. Do you like it when somebody just stands there and stares at you? No. And they don't stop. Good morning. We don't want any adventures here. Thank you. You might try over the hill or across the river. It's his way of saying, go away. Gandalf. What a lot of things you do use good morning for. Now you mean you want to get rid of me. And it won't be good till I move off. Not at all, not at all. Yeah, it's exactly what he means. I don't think I have your name. Gandalf says, well, I know yours. I'm Gandalf. Gandalf means me. To think that I should have been good morning by Belladonna Took's son. Okay, he's not literally Belladonna Took's son. He's Belladonna Took's grandson. Okay. And then Bilbo launches into this big thing about not the Gandalf who did fireworks, led people off on adventures, bottom of page five, who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue for mad adventures, anything from climbing trees to visiting elves, sailing in ships, sailing to other shores. Bless me, life used to be quite ink. And he catches himself. Because what was he going to say? Interesting. Interesting. I mean, you used to upset things badly in these parts. 
I, I didn't know you were still in business, which kind of means I didn't know you were still alive. Right? So what does he mean? Life used to be quite interesting. Notice the tense. It's a little boring now. Yeah, it's boring now. Okay. So Gandalf says, I'll give you what you asked for. Well, I didn't ask for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now you've asked for my pardon. I give it to you. In fact, I will send you on this adventure. Amusing for me, good for you, profitable too. Bilbo's like, I didn't ask for any adventure. Come to tea. Come to tea tomorrow. Gandalf doesn't leave. Bilbo goes inside and thinks, why in the world did I invite him to tea? But he did invite him. Okay? So, the very next morning, or afternoon, there's a knock on the door. Bilbo had forgotten about Gandalf, but now he remembers. But it's not Gandalf. Instead, there's a dwarf with a blue beard stuck into a golden belt. Dwalin shows up. Next, another dwarf shows up. This is an old-looking dwarf with a white beard. This is Balin. Okay. Bilbo invites them in for tea. Remember that hospitality thing I was talking about before? Next, Keely and Feely show up. Okay. Two more dwarves, blue hoods, silver belts, yellow beards. And then they mention the throng. Bilbo's like, throng? I don't like the sound of that. And they mention four more are on their way. But it's not four, it turns out to be five. Page nine. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin, and Glowin. Not Oin, Owen. Okay? And Glowin. And they've got, you know, beards and hoods and all that. Then come Bifer, Bofer, Bomber, and Thorin. And we get a description of Thorin, middle of page 10. An enormously important dwarf, in fact, no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself. He was indeed very haughty and said nothing about service. All the other dwarfs say, you know, Ori Nori, Dori, Owen and Glowen, at your service, that is. We're here to do your will, not Thorin. So, Bilbo now has to cook for 12 dwarves. and Gandalf. So he invites them to stay for supper. The dwarves help set the table and then help take away everything. They sing their little song on page 12. And then on page 13, Thorn unwraps a harp and he starts to play the strings and we're told at the bottom of the page the dark came into the room from the little window that opened in the side of the hill. The firelight flickered. It was April, and still they played on. The dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost, and still they played on. And suddenly first one and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. This, by the way, I've only seen the first one. I won't see the other two. This is the best scene in the first film of The Hobbit. Yeah. I mean, they nail this scene. Other than the dwarves' ridiculous uh, beard styles, you know, the corkscrews and the turns, and they look like, you know, rejects out of uh, the capital city from The Hunger Games. <laughs> Far over the misty mountains cold to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away or break of day to seek the pale, enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells while hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep where dark things sleep in hollow halls beneath the fells. For ancient king and elvish lord there many a gleaming golden hoard they shaped and wrought and light they caught to hide in gems on hilt of sword. Notice, light they caught and hid it in gems and on hilt of sword. 
On silver necklaces they strung the flowering stars, on crowns they hung the dragon fire. In twisted wire they meshed the light of moon and sun. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns cold, old, we must away or break of day to claim our long forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves, and harps of gold, where no man dwell, uh, delves. There lay they long, and many a song was sung unheard by men or elves. The pines were roaring on the height, the winds were moaning in the night. The fire was red, it flaming spread, the trees like torches blazed with light talking about the coming of Smaug. The bells were ringing in the dale, and men looked up with faces pale. The dragon's ire, ire more fierce than fire, laid low their towers and houses frail. The mountains smoked beneath the moon. The dwarves, they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall beneath his feet, beneath the moon. For over the misty mountains grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away or break of day to win our harps and gold from him. This is a, a traveling song. The song is designed to inspire okay, the dwarves to do what they say in that last stanza. We must away or break of day to win our harps and gold from Smaug. And as they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic, moving through him. That is, he feels the love of craftsmanship awakened in his blood. A fierce and jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Okay? Bilbo feels coursing through him the same thing that motivates dwarves. Dwarves are smiths. They're makers. Whether it's makers of swords, makers of gems, makers of crystal, okay? They're shapers. Then something tookish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out of the window. The stars were out in a dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves shining in dark caverns. And suddenly, off in the distance, in the wood, he sees a flame. Probably somebody lighting a wood fire. But maybe not. And he thinks of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill. And that makes him shudder and brings him back home. Why? Well, the idea of a dragon being in close proximity, that's not something Bibble liked. The idea of a dragon being hundreds of miles away and having to travel that far away to see it, that's different. But a dragon on the hill next to his? No. He got up trembling. Thorne asked where he's going. And so Thorne speaks to discuss their plans. And Bilbo falls, page 17. Gandalf says, excitable little fellow. Gets funny queer fits, but he's one of the best, one of the best. Fierce as a dragon in a pinch, that is, when push comes to shove, he'll be the right person. Okay. Bilbo goes out of the room. And he hears Glowin speaking. Will he do? It's all very well for Gandalf to talk about this hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that, in a moment of excitement, that would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives. And we'd be toast. Okay. But Bilbo hears that from the other side of the door. And he hears Balin say, he looks more like a grocer than a burglar. Like somebody who ought to be handing out vegetables and staples and supplies. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. The took side had won. That is, Bilbo's kind of ancestral genes had been warring within him, and now the adventurous side wins. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought fierce. And he says, pardon me, 
If I've overheard words that you were saying, I don't pretend to understand what you were talking about or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing that you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago. And I'm quite sure you've come to the wrong, wrong house. That is, there's no mark on my door. You don't belong here. You've got the wrong house. I'm not the burglar you were seeking for. But treat it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of the east and fight the wild wereworms in the last desert. I'm not the one you're seeking for, but I will do what you ask. Okay. So what is Bilbo, in his mind, doing? Not according to what Gandalf put on the door. He's like looking out for himself a little bit. Yeah, keep going, though. Um, Gandalf essentially said, this guy's looking for an adventure. Bilbo is saying, uh-uh. He wasn't looking for one, but he'll do it. Exactly. He's volunteering. He's saying, I... You've got the wrong place. I was never supposed to be the one you came to. But now, because they think he's no good, it's like he has to prove himself. Okay? So, Gandalf says, end of argument, I've chosen Bilbo, page 19, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he's a burglar, he's a burglar, or he will be when the time comes. So Gandalf pulls out the map, that he gives to Thorin, says he got it from his father. Um, let's see here. After Thorin talks about how they were driven away from the Lonely Mountain, page 24, Thorin says at the bottom, I've often wondered about my father's and my grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door on the Lonely Mount, so that when the dragon came, Thorin and his friends were already outside the mountain. Okay? The dragon came, killed all the dwarves inside the mountain, and he says, my father and grandfather escaped. There must have been a secret passage. And then he says, they made a map, and I'd like to know how Gandalf got a hold of it. And why didn't Excuse me, come down to me, the rightful heir. Gandalf, I did not get hold of it. I was given it. Because got hold of it makes it sound like, you know, he stole it or... Your grandfather, Thror, was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog, the goblin, who's the big Betty in the Hobbit films. Notice, he's mentioned once in the novel. And he's kind of the central antagonist in the films. Okay? So Gandalf talks about Thrain going off to rescue his father. Page 25. Well, your father gave me this to give to you. He says, when your father gave it to me, he could not remember his own name. And he never told me yours. Why couldn't he remember his own name? Why couldn't he remember his son's name? Okay. No, go back um, down to 25 still. Middle of the page. Your grandfather gave the map to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. Your father went away to try his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed. Lots of adventures of a most unpleasant sort he had, but he never got near the mountain. How he got there, I don't know, but I found him a prisoner in the dungeons of the necromancer. Okay? So, um, Thrain, okay, um, man, Thorin's father tried to go back to the last Lonely Mountain to kill Smaug and to restore the family dynasty, as it were, but he never got there. Somehow, on the way there, Gandalf says, he was captured by the necromancer. Gandalf, or Tolkien in The Lord of the, in the Hobbit, never tells us who the necromancer is. We do find out in The Lord of the Rings 
the necromancer is Sauron. They just don't call him by that name here. All right? Gandalf says, when Thorin asked, what were you doing there? Never you mind. I was finding things out as usual. In a nasty, dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering. Why? <clears throat> He'd been tortured. Right? So Thorin says, We long ago paid the goblins of Moria. Really? It's not the impression we get when you read the Lord of the Rings. We must give a thought to the necromancer. Gandalf, don't be absurd. He is an enemy quite beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together if they could all be collected again from the four corners of the world. The one thing your father wished for was for his son to read the map and use the key. Okay? So, they go off to sleep. The next morning, Bilbo wakes up. The dwarves have already left. Gandalf tells him to get a move on. So, he runs off after them, catches up to them. And... The rain comes, Gandalf disappears. The rain comes, they're soaked to the skin, even their dry clothes. It's gotten into the food bags, we're told, page 32. And they see a fire off in the distance. And that's when they realize Gandalf's gone. Some say they should go investigate the fire. Others say they shouldn't. So on page 34, they decide the burglar will do it. Okay. What is Bilbo's job according to his contract? Go back to the beginning of that chapter. Page 29, or the second page of the chapter. Thorn and company, Burglar Bilbo, greeting for your hospitality, our sincere thanks for your offer of professional assistance, our grateful acceptance. Terms, cash on delivery, up to and not exceeding one fourteenth of total profits, if any. All traveling expenses guaranteed in any event. Funeral expenses to be defrayed by us or our representatives. It's not spelled out. It's just he's burglar. It doesn't say to burgle his way into the Dwarves Mountain and such. So, they say, we have a burglar, go do your job. You must go on, page 34, you must go on and find out all about the light, what it is for, and if it is all perfectly safe and canny. Now, scuttle off and come back quick, if all is well. If not, come back if you can. If you can't come back, hoot twice like a barn owl and once like a screech owl. And Bilbo goes off thinking, I don't know how to do either of those. Okay. So he goes off, and who does he meet? Three trolls. And because he's a burglar, he tries to burgle one. He sticks his hand into a troll pocket. Okay. Page 36. Eh, who are you? Says the troll. Blimey, Bert. Look what I've caught. And Bilbo says he's a Bilbo Baggins, a Burr Hobbit. Okay. So we get this long passage where the dwarves come and they get captured by the trolls. And then we hear the trolls start arguing back and forth. And on page 41, Dawn take you all and be stoned to you. Turns out Gandalf was playing ventriloquist, throwing his voice. And so the trolls are all turned to stone because the sun comes up. And they find the trolls' cave, hideout. And they take swords. Bilbo takes one. Thorin and Gandalf each take one. Okay. They ask Gandalf where he went to. Bottom of 43, he says to look ahead. And what brought you back in the nick of time? Looking behind. Notice how Gandalf kind of likes to speak in riddles. Okay. Then we get chapter 3, a short rest. What's the short rest? They go to Rivendell. Okay. Elrond's 
quote-unquote kingdom. And our first introduction to elves is on page 48. Kind of a silly little inconsequential song. Okay, this is just a few pages into that chapter. And they go down to Elrond's house and we're told the master of the house was an elf friend. One of those people whose fathers came into the strange stories before the beginning of history. The wars of the evil goblins and the elves and the first men in the north. In those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elves and heroes of the north for ancestors. And Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. Okay? He's Elrond half-elven. One ancestor was elf, another one was human. He was as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, wise as a wizard, venerable as a king of doors, and as kind as summer. Comes into many tales, but his part in the story of Bilbo's great adventures is only a small one. Okay? So, Elrond, we're told, is a rune master. And so he takes the map, and he takes the swords, and he tells um, Thorin and Gandalf, this thorn, the rune's name Orchrist, that is the sword that he got from the trolls, the goblin cleaver, in the ancient tongue of Gondolin. It was a famous blade. This Gandalf was Glamdring, foe hammer, that the king of Gondolin once wore. So Tolkien introduces a name that is present only in his manuscripts at this time, the name of Gondolin. Okay? When people read The Hobbit in 1937, Tolkien started to get letters. Tell us more about the High Elves. Tell us more about Gondolin. Tell us more about Elrond's history. Okay? They had to wait 17 years for The Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings doesn't give them much more information about Gondolin. It gives you a little bit more information about Elrond. But about the great deeds of the past... Well, we hear about that essentially in two major chapters in The Fellowship of the Ring. Okay? So, he reads the map, says it's got runes written in moon letters, and he explains moon letters are rune letters, but you can't see them when you look straight at them. They can only be seen when the moon shines behind them. And there are even some that can only be seen when the same kind of moon, same time of year, Okay, as when the letters were written, shines behind them. And he reads, Stand by the gray stone when the thrush knocks, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Okay, now it's kind of interesting what happened in this little scene, because we've just kind of been told Elrond knows everything, or seemingly so. But he doesn't know what Durin's day is. The Elrond of the Lord of the Rings would know what Durin's day is. So would Gandalf. Okay? So what's Durin's day? The first day of the Dwarves' New Year, says Thorin. Is, as all should know, the first day of the last moon of autumn on the threshold of winter. Okay? He says we still call it Durin's day when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky together. So, sun's rising, moon is setting. They leave Elrond's, and we get over hill and under hill. Okay. They go up into the misty mountains. They take shelter in a cave. And the back of the cave opens up, and they get captured by goblins. Um, Gandalf rescues them and as they're marching on along Dory gets snagged from behind and drops Bilbo who bumps his head and passes out and that brings us to chapter 5 Riddles in the Dark he opens his eyes Bilbo does doesn't know how long he's been out. 
starts to move around on all fours, and he his hand comes across a ring, a metal ring. Like a tiny ring of cold metal lying on the floor of the tunnel. It was a turning point in his career, but he did not know it. He put the ring in his pocket almost without thinking. It didn't seem of any particular use at the moment. Okay. So he keeps going on. <clears throat> Pulls his blade out. And his blade has a bluish glow to it. And so he realizes it too is an elvish blade. It kind of gives you a warning when there are goblins about. So he sits there and notice we're told he's comforted. It was rather splendid to be wearing a blade made in Gondolin for the Goblin Wars, which so many songs had sung. And also he noticed that such weapons made a great impression on goblins. So he's sitting there and he's thinking, what do I do? Go back? No good at all. Go sideways? Impossible. Go forward? Only thing to do. Remember what happens to Anodos and Fantastes? He thinks when he's in the one old woman's house of going back, and she says, how are you going to do that? As far as I know, when you enter Fairyland, the only way to get out of Fairyland is to go through it. Okay? So, Bilbo's the same way. He has to keep going forward. The journey always, he's going to sing a song, always goes on, the road on. It never goes back. Okay. So, he makes his way down and finds this pool or lake. And we're told, down here by the dark water lived old Gollum, a small, slimy creature. Narrator says, I don't know who he was, where he came from. He's been there a long time. Gollum is aware when Bilbo arrives. Gollum says, bless us and bless us, my precious. I guess it's a choice feast. At least a tasty morsel that it'd make of Gollum. Okay. Bilbo hears Gollum. Gollum says, what is he, my precious? Bilbo answers, I am Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I've lost the dwarves. I've lost the wizard. Don't know where I am. I don't want to know. If only I can get away. Gollum asks, what's he got in his hands? Is? Bilbo's got the sword. Gollum says, perhaps he sits here and chats with it a bit. See, my precious, it likes riddles, perhaps it does, does it? Bilbo's like, okay. Notice, they know the same riddles. Okay. What's that indicate? The yeah, there's the shared background somewhere. Whether it's 50 years ago, 100 years ago, we're not told here. We are told in the Lord of the Rings. Okay. Moreover, they know the rules to the riddles. And riddling does have complex sets of rules in terms of what is a real riddle. The last question Bilbo asks is not a riddle. What do I have in my pockets isn't a riddle. A qu just a mere question is not the same thing. So they go back and forth. And when they do this, it's all predicated on if Bilbo wins, Gollum will show him the way out. If Gollum wins, he gets to eat Bilbo. So when Bilbo runs out of time... Gollum says, when he finally guesses time to the last riddle Gollum proposes, Gollum says, it's got to ask us a question, my precious. Yes, 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 just one more question, yes. Ask us, ask us. And Bilbo sticks his hands in his pockets. What have I got in my pocket? Not fair, not fair. Is it fair, my precious? Is it to ask us what it's got in its nasty little pockets? Bilbo thinks that's the riddle he's proposed. What have I got in my pocket? 
must give us three guesses, my precious three. Why? Because it's not a fair question. It's not a fair riddle. So Bilbo, Bilbo agrees. Hands is. He removed his hands just in time. Wrong. Guess again. Knife. Notice, Gollum thought of all the things he kept in his own pockets. Fishes, uh, fish bones, goblin's teeth, wet shells, a bit of bat wing, sharp stone to sharpen his fangs on, and other nasty things. He tried to think what other people kept in their pockets. Knife. Wrong. Last guess. Bubble. String. Uh, gone. String or nothing. Okay. It's two answers. Bilbo knew, of course, that the riddle game was sacred and of immense antiquity, and even wicked creatures were afraid to cheat when they played at it. But he felt he could not trust this slimy thing to keep any promise at a pinch. But Gollum doesn't attack him immediately. He could see the sword in Bilbo's hand. So Bilbo says, okay, what about your promise? I want to go. You must show me the way. Did we say so, precious? Show the nasty little baggins the way out? Yes, yes. But what has it got in its pockets? Is? Bobo, you don't get asked now. I don't have to tell you. Cross it is impatient, precious. But it must wait. Yes, it must. We can't go up the tunnel. It's so hasty. So Gollum goes back to his island for what? His precious. The ring. And he gets there. And he starts to scream. Lost it is, my precious, lost, lost, curse us and gracious, my precious is lost. Bilbo, what have you lost? You mustn't ask us, not its business, no golem, it's lost. Bilbo, well, so am I, and I want to get unlost, and I won the game, and you promised. So come along, come and let me out, and then go on with your looking. And Gollum starts to think. Never guessed. What has it got in its pockets? Is? Bilbo, don't have to answer that. But it wasn't a fair question, not a riddle, precious. Oh, well, if it's a matter of ordinary questions, then I ask one first. What have you lost? Tell me that first. What has it got in its pockets? Is? Bilbo, what have you lost? And now the light in Gollum's eyes had become a green fire. And it was coming quickly nearer. And he hears, what has it got in its pockets? And Bilbo starts to wonder, what do I have in my pocket? Reaches down in, and when he does, the ring just slips on the end of his finger. And Gollum comes at him, and Bilbo's thinking he's about to die, and Gollum goes right past him. What could it mean? Gollum could see in the dark. Bilbo could see the light of his eyes palely shining even from behind. And he follows Gollum. And Gollum leads him to an opening. And we're told, Gollum says, what shall we do? Curse them, crush them. We must wait here, precious. Wait a bit and see. So they come to a dead stop. Gollum had brought Bilbo to the way out after all, but Bilbo could not get in because Gollum is standing and blocking the gap. There was Gollum, sitting, humped up right in the opening, and his eyes gleamed cold in his head as he swayed it from side to side between his knees. So Bilbo comes up close to Gollum. And we're told, Bilbo almost stopped breathing and went stiff himself. He was desperate. He must get away, out of this horrible darkness, while he had any strength left. He must fight. He must stab the most foul thing, put its eye out, kill it. It meant to kill him. Does Gollum mean to kill Bilbo? Yes, definitely. There's no doubt. But then part of Bilbo says, no, not a fair fight. Why? Because he was invisible now. If Gollum had found his precious, would it have been a fair fight? No, because then Gollum would be invisible. Gollum had no sword. Gollum had not actually threatened to kill him, or tried to yet. 
and he was miserable, alone, lost. Notice what's going through Bilbo's mind. A sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror, welled up in Bilbo's heart. Pity. He feels for Gollum. A glimpse of endless unmarked days without light or hope <coughs> or betterment. Hard stone, cold fish, sneaking and whispering. Bilbo has a little inkling of what Gollum's life is like. And he takes pity on him. All these thoughts passed in a flash of a second. He trembled. And then quite suddenly in another flash, he jumps. Okay? No great leap for a man, but a leap in the dark. Like a leap of faith. Straight over Gollum's head. Seven feet forward, three in the air. How big is Bilbo? About three feet tall. So a three-foot-tall person jumping, like standing broad jump, seven feet. Okay? About the length of that table. I mean, that's a good distance for an adult human to do, who might be five and a half, six feet. Bilbo's only three feet. He's jumping twice his length. That would be like me doing that kind of jump from here to pass that end of the table, it'd be almost 12 feet, okay? And he jumps three feet in the air. That would be like me getting my feet from just jumping up to almost six feet in the air. That would, frankly, be superhuman, okay? I don't mean like a high jump, you know, where you have different methods of, you know, jumping seven feet, five inches, and such. And that's not the kind of jump he's doing, because he lands on his feet. Okay? And so Bilbo escapes from Gollum. He makes his way out, and he realizes he's gone right through the Misty Mountains. He hears voices. He sneaks up on Balin. And he thinks, I'm going to give him all a surprise. And he hears the dwarves talking with Gandalf. Gandalf, after all, he is my friend and not a bad little chap. I feel responsible for him. I wish to goodness you had not lost him. The dwarves wanted to know why he'd ever been brought at all, why he could not stick to his friends and come along with him, and why the wizard had not chosen someone with more sense. He'd been more trouble than you so far. You know, he kind of got him in trouble, got them caught by the trolls. If we have got to go back now into those abominable tunnels to look for him, then drat him, I say. Okay. Gandalf says we need to get him. And Bilbo just kind of appears. And here's the burglar. And they all jump. He explains what happened with Gollum. Doesn't say anything about the ring. And we're told, Gandalf says, What did I tell you, said Gandalf, laughing. Mr. Baggins has more about him than you can guess. And he gives Bilbo a queer look from under his bushy eyebrows as he said this. And the hobbit wondered if he guessed at the part of his tale he had left out. Okay, because he doesn't say anything about the ring. Um... They make their way into the woods. They hear the howling of the wolves. They climb up in the trees only to be surrounded by the wolves and goblins. And Gandalf tries to, you know, burn the wolves and goblins. And they are rescued by the eagles. We're going to skip a bunch. The eagles take them far away. Drop them off at the Carrick, which is a place that Bjorn goes to. Chapter 7, Queer Lodgings. Gandalf takes them to Bjorn's, and he explains to them who Bjorn is. Um, well, in my book, it's around page 114. It's 
three or four pages into the chapter. To somebody I spoke of, a very great person, you must all be very polite when I introduce you. I shall introduce you slowly, two by two. Do not annoy him. Okay. He can be appalling when he's angry, though he's kind enough if humored. So, Gandalf says, If you must know more, he's, his name is Bayorn. He's very strong. He's a skin changer. Okay. Bilbo thinks skin changer. Like somebody who calls rabbits conies, a furrier, and turns their skins into something? Gandalf, no. Don't be a fool, Mr. Baggins, if you can help it. In the name of all wonder, don't mention the word furrier again as long as you're within 100 miles of his house. Nor rug, cape, tippet, muff, nor any other such unfortunate word. All of those have to deal with being made out of animal skin. He is a skin changer. He changes his skin. Sometimes he's a huge black bear. Sometimes he's a great, strong, black-haired man with huge arms and a great beard. Okay? Gandalf. Can't tell you much more. Some say he's a bear descended from the great ancient bears of the mountains that lived there before the giants came. Others that he's a man descended from the first men who lived before Smaug or the other dragons came into that part of the world. He says, I don't know which. At any rate, he is under no enchantment but his own. Why does Tolkien include that? Think of something like, um, oh, which one? Um, Beauty and the Beast. What's the problem with Beast? Under he's under a spell. He's under whose spell? The witches. The witches. Okay. Notice, Bjorn isn't under anybody's enchantment. That is, he has this power of himself. He controls himself. Okay. He talks about, you know, how he raises cattle and horses. He raises bees, etc. So, they make their way towards Bjorn's. They come across some horses, and the horses go off to Bjorn's house. And Gandalf says they've gone to tell him. Okay. So Gandalf shows up at Bjorn's and says, I'm Gandalf. Never heard of him. Who's this little fellow? This is Mr. Baggins, a hobbit of good family, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So Bjorn says, I've never heard of you. So Gandalf kind of has a trump card. It says, um, even if you haven't heard of me, I've heard of you. Perhaps you've heard of my good cousin Radagast. Not a bad fellow, as wizards go. Okay, what do you want? Lost our luggage, nearly lost our way. Talks about the trouble with the goblins. Okay. So Bjorn says, well, you better come inside and tell me your whole story. They do. And Gandalf says, as I was coming over the mountains with a friend or two, Bjorn looks next to Gandalf and there's Bilbo. I can see only one and a little one. Well, there, there are more. I wanted to make sure it was okay before I call them. Call away. Okay. Thorn and Dory come in. One or three, you meant, says Bjorn. These aren't hobbits, they are dwarves. Okay? Notice Thorn. Thorn Oakenshield at your service. Dory at your service. Thorn didn't offer his service to Bilbo, but he does to Bjorn. I don't need your service, but I expect you need mine. Don't really like dwarves. Okay? They talk about being on their way to their homeland, etc., etc. Gandalf mentions then several of their companions caught by the goblins. Do you call two several? Well, no, there were more than two. Killed, eaten, gone home? No. They haven't all come when I whistled. So Bjorn's kind of like, let's get on with this. So all the others come in. Okay. 
And he finally says, 14. That's the first time I've heard one from 10 leave 14. Okay. Owen and Glowen come in. Bifer and Bofer come in. And finally, Bomber. So, they tell Bjorn the whole tale, and he offers them food, tells them to stay inside the hall that night while he goes out in his um, bear form. Okay. He gives them horses, and they go on. They get to the edge of Mirkwood Forest, and Gandalf tells them he's got to leave. Don't leave the path. Bayorn has already talked about, has already told them about, about the path that leaves, leads through Mirkwood Forest. And it said, don't leave the path. So what happens? They get off into the forest, and they see light off the path. Just as with the trolls, they go to investigate the light, they lose their way. Okay? They get captured by the spiders. Bilbo rescues them. They get captured by the wood elves. Okay? I'm going to skip a bunch. And taken by the wood elves. This is um, just a couple pages before the end of the chapter. The feasting people were wood elves, of course. These are not wicked folk. If they have a fault, it is distrust of strangers. Though their magic was strong, even in those days, they were very wary. They differed from the high elves of the West and were more dangerous and less wise. Of course, we don't know anything about the high elves of the West. They've not been referred to, other than Gondolin. Okay? For most of them, together with their scattered relations in the hills and mountains, were descended from the ancient tribes that never went to fairy in the West. Fairy is the land of Valinor that's referred to in Lord of the Rings. There, the Light Elves and the Deep Elves and the Sea Elves went and lived for ages and grew fairer and wiser and more learned. What Tolkien is doing here is he's bringing in aspects of the stories he's been working on for over 20 years. But he's not giving a lot of detail. Okay? Because the Hobbit, while part of or residing in Middle-earth doesn't really fit with the rest of the stories Tolkien creates about it. That is, The Hobbit doesn't fit with The Lord of the Rings. The descriptions of the elves, for example, the description of Elrond, does not match at all the description of Elrond that we get in The Lord of the Rings. In The Lord of the Rings, Elrond is serious, he's solemn, he's lofty. Here, He's kind of flighty, and the elves of Rivendell are kind of flighty, okay? Still, elves they were and remain, and that is good people. Our narrator is telling us the elves are distrustful of people, but basically they're good at heart. Unless you're a dwarf. Because what happens, and we're going to stop early, because what happens to... Thorin and company. They get in prison. Okay. Bilbo doesn't. Why not? He's got the well, he's got the ring and they don't see him. Okay. We're going to stop there. We'll pick up with Barrels Out of Bond um, Thursday. So there's not much to do. Go ahead and start because we'll finish it hopefully fairly quickly. Go ahead and start or read, if you haven't before, um, Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. And maybe we can start.